This is London calling. Here is the chief engineer who's going to give you one of his technical talks. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to talk tonight about fading. Fading is probably one of the most important things that one's got to consider in this whole art of wireless. You see, when a station has a particular radiation, it sends it out along the ground. Now, those waves are the waves that you want to receive, those waves along the ground. But unfortunately, a wave has sort of aerial ambitions and shooting up skywards, it impinges on a thing we call the heavy side layer. Now, the waves that go out from the station to the heavy side layer do not suffer the attenuation they have when going along the ground. I mean, you know the sort of attenuation you suffer when you're going along the ground. We weren't an, uh, simply and only interested in um, broadcasting this frivolous stuff that you might think that we did. We had serious artists. For instance, we had Melchior. Well, Melchior had just been married, apparently, and he'd left his wife comforted by a crystal set in Denmark, and he believed that the louder he uh, sang, the more likely his wife, uh, his new wife, was to hear him. And um, so when the opening bars were played, he sucked in his breath, which pulled the windows shut, and he gave a bellow that shut the station down. And uh, I remember afterwards, he used to wander about the place and say, uh, what's that bust component there? Oh, well, of course, that's part of the milk door breakdown. That is, uh, yes, I got that thing burst into flame. You know, I'm not going to talk about it, you know that I have deep down in me the feeling that a great deal could be done to improve the signal-to-noise ratio, even of the VHF, by using wires where wireless serves now. But I will not go into that. It's a vexed question. If you got a wireless set as an amateur which had never done more than go pa 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 and then suddenly you heard a voice or even music, I mean, it was fascinating. And the Postmaster General, on whom be everlasting peace, uh, he uh, realised that um, we, uh, couldn't, um, we couldn't have uh, such a thing as this without committee judgement and serious consideration. But somehow or another, there was a... Um, an idea among the amateurs, who are amateurs, they're called hams. They're the people who wound coils and uh, drilled ebonite and uh, did all the happy things that you do do with valves and wireless sets, Master General, that they might have a station so that uh, they could have a constant source to, against which to calibrate their receivers. And um, the result of this, peti uh, this petition was uh, very naturally it was turned down. But under the influence of shock tactics, the preparation of another petition, eventually it was decided that there should be a station for these amateurs. I happened to be in the Marconi Company at the time, and um, we inhabited um, a place called Rittle, uh, a hut, a long, low hut for the long, low people. And um, we had a wireless transmitter, and we were eventually appointed by the Radio Society of Great Britain to do this thing called broadcasting. We had to talk into this thing and give them signals. It was very formal, Mark you. There was a license that we were given. The license said uh, that um, the power had to be limited to one kilowatt, was it? And that had to include the power that was uh, necessary for illuminating the or heating the filaments of the valve. But it took two kilowatts to do that already. However, we, <laughs> we still owe the Postmaster General a number of kilowatts. But uh, we went ahead, nevertheless, and that's how probably the first regular broadcasting station in Britain ever started. There was one before it. I'm a little jealous about the one that preceded it. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm talking about regular broadcasting, and gee, boy, were we regular. We were, we were half an hour a week, half an hour a week, every Tuesday. And um, we just broadcast, that's all. Um, you know, with Rittle, uh, we didn't have any elaborate studio or any wonderful gadgets and uh, things like that. What we had a gramophone record, we had a perfectly good mechanical gramophone with open doors. And you opened the doors and you put the needle on and it scratched and it played little music. 
and then you held the microphone in front of the open doors where the sound poured out from. Sorry about the preposition at the end of the sentence, but that's how it was. And if you wanted it louder, you just moved the microphone nearer. And if you wanted it softer, you moved the microphone further away. We were able to keep one of the smoothest volume control that has ever been invented. Of course, today, I mean, there are sliding resistor wires and wonderful faders and this and that, but <laughs> pioneers are always no best. It cannot be more sufficiently emphasized that that pioneer adventure was born in laughter, was nurtured in laughter, and died in laughter. And I want to believe that if only people would see their jobs, if only people would see their lives in terms of its humour, of its excitement, and that a job well done deserves laughter, and not the solemnity of the pomp administrator on top of it. If we could only see that the thing that we do is a God-given thing for heaven's sake because it's creative and it's fun and it's exciting, then I think all these certificates, all these rules, all these rather dull regulations might be seen to be unnecessary besides people who are essentially poets.